Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, we will talk today about nucleus of the atom. Basically, it's kind of a, again, historical essay about what actually happened, how one discovery le le led to another discovery. Um, not too much calculations or anything like that. Um, now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unisort.com. Um, well, it's a course, basically. It contains mechanics, electromagnetic uh, um, uh, chapter, it has atoms like this one and, and others. Um, so, I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website, Unisort.com. If you found it somewhere on YouTube, or somewhere else, it's just one lecture by itself. But I think the value is in the course. So you take the course, you take one lecture uh, after another. They are positioned, presented in logical order. There are menus which drive it. Um, the website also contains prerequisite um, course called Math for Teens, um, mandatory to learn physics, absolutely. Um, the site is totally free, there are no advertisement, so it's nothing, nothing financial about this particular website, so it's just pure knowledge and I do recommend you to use it to your full extent. Plus there are some exams in some cases, which basically help you to realize how well you are uh, in control of the information. Again, you, you, you can take these exams as many times as you want until you will get a perfect score. <laughs> okay, so, we're talking about history basically right now. History of um, discoveries in, in physics, in particular about atoms. So, I will touch briefly on a few events, maybe a couple of comments basically, and that's it. That's what that, that's this lecture is about. I will introduce certain terminology. Uh, mention a few facts, but there is no theory. It's primarily experimental physics and models which physicists came up with based on the experiments and gradually coming to a point where we are, well, not right now, but where in 1920s, 1930s actually. So, one of the first things which people have discovered, and I didn't mention it before, was um, experiment uh, in 1897, Thomson, English, British um, physicist, discovered um, electrons. Now, his experiments were related to cathode rays, so-called cathode rays, which means basically a tube with positive and negative um, connection into it, and uh, if you start um, heating up the cathode with the, the negative uh, connector, um, well, right now we know it emits electrons because electrons are getting excited and they're bumped out uh, because of the energy which is supplied by electricity, the electrons are, are bumped out. Now, if you have certain detection, and in this particular case, detection of negative particles, that's exactly what Thompson did. He discovered that from the uh, uh, cathode, the, the rays which were emitted were negatively charged particles. So that basically started the whole thing, and that was a discovery of electrons. Now, what happened later? So, later he suggested that atom is basically like a positive soup with uh, electrons embedded in it. Well, soup probably is not a good word. He suggested something like plum pudding, if that would make it better, whatever. In any case, it's a solid, basically, uh, mass with small negative um, particles embedded in a positive environment, so to speak, pudding. Okay, next. Next was a very important person mentioned here, 
Rutherford, also a British physicist. Well, I have to really um, tell that Rutherford was actually a whole school of brilliant physicists from, from different countries, by the way. <coughs> he built, I think it was Manchester University, uh, he built a great uh, team of people uh, when he came as a professor of physics into this um, university and they were great experimentalists so they built certain devices which helped them to discover certain things now um, one of the first things which his group was involved was related to radioactivity the radioactive decay so called um, it was observed that certain element like uranium or thorium or radium um, emitted certain things. Now they were trying basically to investigate what are these certain things and they have divided it into three categories alpha, beta and gamma rays. Well it turned to be much later that alpha rays were actually the nucleus of helium which is a combination of two protons and two neutrons but that was much later at that time it was just alpha rays whatever it was beta rays again later on it was discovered it was basically electrons and uh, gamma rays are electromagnetic radiation of very high frequency uh, very penetrating um, they have a shorter wavelength than let's say um, the visible spectrum. So these so-called rays, alpha, beta and gamma rays, were directed towards certain elements and well they saw what happens. Now at that particular moment in time um, one of the experiments which uh, the Rutherford was, was actually conducting was he, direct, he was directing alpha particles Again, as I, I'm, I'm telling later on, it was positive nucleus, nucleus of helium. So directed alpha particles um, through the gold foil, very, very thin gold foil. And he discovered that some of the particles just went through. He detected on the other side with some apparatus. And uh, some of them were basically deflected into different direction, even into opposite direction. So that brought him to a, a, um, a planetary model of atom, because those particles which went through probably were like in between the nucleus and and the electron orbits, and those which were reflected back were probably those who hit the nucleus itself. And he was actually been able to judge how many of them went through, how many were reflected back, and that gave them um, more or less um, some kind of idea about how much geometrical space is occupied by nucleus and how much uh, is empty. So he came up to, with the idea that atom is practically empty. Um, there is a very very small nucleus and there is and there are some electrons circulating around it that was his hypothesis planetary model and uh, in between there is basically an empty space um, now electrons are held by nucleus because nucleus must be positive then so that's his contribution he basically suggested that nucleus is inside the atom as a positively charged um, particle, if you wish. Uh, electrons are negatively charged and they are rotating around um, atom, around nucleus of the atom, so that keeps them on the orbit. Um, I mean, if they do not rotate, they would just fall on the nucleus and basically the whole atom would collapse. So that would contradict the stability of, of our matter, all, all the atoms. So he suggested that electrons are circulating on orbits around the nucleus 
and uh, obviously the charge of nucleus must be equal to a sum of the charges of all electrons which are surrounding um, the nucleus and different um, elements, different elements actually uh, have different number of nucleus and that's why they have more charged in, in the nucleus itself to keep so the the charge should be uh, the same of the same magnitude positive charge of nucleus should be of the same magnitude as some of the charges of all neg negative electrons okay now he uh, also suggested that um, nucleus of hydrogen now we know that this is just one proton so nucleus of the hydrogen is present as part of nuclei of other elements he was dealing with which again in contemporary language means that the proton exists in every element as a piece of the nuclei so that was his um, well, I don't know, suggestion or proof or that that's all experimentally proven um, what's next and then he also suggested that inside the nuclear um, might must be um, some other particles not just positively charged um, he called them neutrons but he actually said that these neutrons probably are coupled together proton and neutron and, 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 and electron, sorry, to come to a neutral particles, which he called neutron. Now, that actually was not proven by any kind of experiment, and it's not exactly true, um, but it's, a, it's an interesting hypothesis. So he suggested that certain electrons are just not surrounding on orbits, but they are coupled with some proton. Um, I don't think that the term proton was at, th at that time actually used. I think they were using a nuclei, nucleus of hydrogen, well, which now we know is the same. So um, he was suggesting this new particle, which is actually a combo particle, a couple of uh, two particles, proton and, and electron, coupled together. So nothing, surround, n nothing is rotating around, around anything else. And they are also part of the of the nuclei, nucleus, which did not turn out to be true. But anyway, the word neutron actually retained by physics, and it was used later on when the real neutrons were discovered. Next, next was actually the discovery of neutrons by another British physicist, Chadwick, in 1932. So, again, there are certain experiments he conducted, and I'm not going into what kind of experiments. They are really very sophisticated experiments to basically detect elementary particles such as, such as neutron. So, in 1932, he suggested this, and um, immediately after that, after the neutron as, as a particle was discovered by Chadwick, um, two physicists, uh, German uh, Heisenberg and Russian Ivanenko, um, came up with the model of the nucle nucleus as we know it right now, as containing certain number of protons and neutrons. So these are individual building blocks of the matter, particles. One particle is proton, another particle is neutron, and the combination of them both actually created a nucleus of the atom. How many of these protons and neutrons and electrons are in every element? Well, it's a different number, different um, uh, elements have different number of protons, neutrons, and, and electrons. 
now um, to somehow um, symbolically express this structure of the element, they came up with notation as follows. First, there is a letter which is abbreviation of the name of the element. So H stands for hydrogen, for example. And then there are two numbers. One number is number of protons, and number two is number of protons and neutrons. And by the way, number of protons is equal to number of electrons. So that basically describes the atom of hydrogen. Now, what if I have hydrogen with one proton and one neutron, making the total number of particles inside the uh, nucleus to two? So it's one proton and one neutron. Okay. So that's basically kind of the same element, but not exactly the same. So there is a term for this, isotopes. This is isotope. Isotopes. So hydrogen has a hy uh, an isot uh, I I isotope with one neutron, with two, with no, with no neutrons, with one neutron, and also there is a uh, isotope with two neutrons, making the total number of three. So this is called atomic number and this is called atomic mass so total number of particles protons plus neutrons is called atomic mass in this case it's three for example and uh, the number of protons which is equal to number of electrons is called atomic number and all elements including their isotopes when the number of neutrons actually was different they were basically constituting what elements we deal with okay um, now let me just give you a few examples by the way these isotopes of hydrogen have names. Um, uh, for other elements, they're just different numbers. They, they, they have the same element, uh, element name, but no different names for isotopes. This is called hydrogen, this is uh, deuterium, and this is tritium. But again, that's only for hydrogen. Helium, for example, the general helium, 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 that's basically atomic number is two, atomic mass is four because there are two um, uh, protons and two neutrons usually. And by the way, the nucleus of helium is alpha particles as it was dis uh, um, discovered later on. Now, what else uh, example I have? Carbon, six protons and six neutrons. By the way, you see, the number of protons and neutrons here and here is the same. Two protons, two neutrons making it four, six protons and six neutrons making it twelve. It's not necessarily true for other elements. For example, you have uranium, for example, you have 92 protons, and one element is 235. Uh, another isotope of uranium, also 92 protons, as 238. This is much more frequently occurring in, uh, in Earth, basically, and uh, this one is a very rare one, but it's this one which is used in atomic bomb, um, and whenever they are um, mining the uranium, it's usually this one, and they are using certain process to convert this into this. So they have basically uh, fuel for um, atomic bombs. Okay, so we have covered, yeah, 
a couple of more examples. This is gold, Aurum in Latin. It has 79 protons and the mass is 197. So the number of neutrons, as you see, is what? One. Uh, this is, eight, this is one, 118, right? Something like this. 118. 118 neutrons and 79 protons. Different number, as you see. This is also different. Neutrons significantly more than protons. Um, now, now and this is a very interesting point right now. Um, you see why electrons are on orbits around nucleus is kind of understandable because nucleus is positively charged electrons are negatively charged and if they are rotating well that's the electrostatic uh, force acts uh, between positive and negative they are attracting to each other but because it's uh, rotating it, it it keeps the orbit well, there is a problem with this planetary model, which Bohr introduced, as I was uh, previously talking about, to, to overcome this problem. But in any case, that's kind of understandable. Now, here is the question. Protons are all positively charged. So what holds together the nucleus? Because nucleus contains like 79 protons or 92 protons. Why aren't they th just repel each other and the whole basically business of uh, nucleus I I is just ending in this particular case. Well, that was a problem which physicists um, had to solve somehow. So apparently their theory was that there are some other forces, not only electrostatic forces. Well, we have gravitational forces, for example, right? So they came up with this idea that there are some other forces which act only on a very, very short distance. So the distance between protons inside the nucleus is minuscule relative to the distance between protons and electrons. So that's why these so-called strong forces between protons and protons and neutrons um, they are acting only within the nucleus. It's a nucleus-specific forces. And these forces always attract different particles. Um, now, what's other interesting thing is, what's the role of neutrons? You see, without neutrons, protons will be the only ones pro uh, uh, which uh, are located within the nucleus with um, neutrons the strong forces between different particles still exist but protons are kind of diluted among neutrons and if neutrons are uh, embedded with protons in the same nucleus the distance between the protons becomes slightly greater than if they were just lumped together and that's why uh, repel, repelling uh, forces, electrostatic forces, are a little bit uh, weaker when there is some distance. You see, the, the repelling forces obviously are uh, much stronger the closer uh, to each other are two positively charged protons. But they are just a little bit on the distance and there is a neutron between them the repelling electrostatic forces are smaller between these protons but the strong forces between proton and neutron and then neutron to proton are e existing and they're the same so if this is the proton and this is neutron and this is another proton the repelling electrostatic forces are smaller than in this case in this case right uh, so because there is a neutron and there is a distance between them but the strong forces the nucleus specific forces between this and this and between this are exactly the same as between this and this 
and that's why the um, this is more stable, so to speak, nucleus. And at the same time, if you have certain deficiency of neutrons, it might have caused an easier breaking of the nucleus under bombarding of this nucleus with certain um, neutrons or alpha particles or something like that. And that's probably one of the reasons why uranium-235 is easier to break under attack of some neutrons, for instance, bombarding, than uranium-238. Because a couple of more neutrons really make it, m making a, a, a nucleus a little bit more stable. Um, I mean, obviously, it all depends on the composition within the nucleus, how they are organized, etc. And it's, uh, it's kind of a difficult uh, question, and uh, I don't think it's supposed to be part of your education right now. Um, the in, in internal structure of the nucleus, it's, it's very, very complex, and apparently uh, these ele so-called elementary particles, like proton and neutron, might contain something within themselves as well, something like nucleus contains protons and neutrons, maybe protons contain something else. We'll talk about this. In any case, so what I would like to say is basically to introduce a new force in nature, a force which exists between uh, particles inside the nucleus. And that basically concludes my, you know, brief half historical um, introduction into nucleus. Um, there are many very interesting stories about how certain discoveries were made, how Rutherford, for example, discovered uh, neutrons and uh, that, that, that uh, not neutrons, the, 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 the protons and the planetary model, how Chadwick discovered uh, neutrons. I mean, the ex uh, experiments, I mean, they, people came up with these experiments. I mean, nobody taught them how to do it. They were researcher, experimentalist, physicists, and they were looking for, you know, some proof of their theories. So that was extremely interesting. It's a very creative process. I mean, people don't probably realize uh, how, how creative the real science actually is, because you have no idea what exactly you're dealing with until you will do some kind of research, etc. So not only artists which are painting uh, uh, some, some pictures are, are creative or, or directors of movies. Physicists and mathematicians are very, very creative people as well. And um, that probably would be a, a nice end for this lecture. So read the notes for this lecture. Um, there are some maybe um, references to some website which, which are good, interesting stories. Um, uh, and that's all on unizor.com and the website. So you go to Atoms, the Physics 14's course, Atoms, and within the Atoms category there is a chapter called Building Blocks of Matter, and that leads to this and other lectures. Okay, thank you very much, and good luck.